You are listening to the Light Over Time podcast with David Sargent and Corey Bartos. It is April 30th, 2023, and Sony still has not updated the A7S III and the A1. How are you, David? I'm okay. Didn't they send updates to, what, the FX30 or something like that? Well, the FX3 and the FX30 got all those updates. Right, okay. They basically okay. gave the FX3, which is an A7S III, all the stuff that I've been complaining about for months. So they're proving they have the capability. They're just not doing it. I mean, they proved it with the freaking new ZV camera. So yes, yeah, yeah. yes, they've proved it. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh yeah, let's start spicy today. <laughs> yeah, so uh, today we'll be digging into my week with the S5 II, talking about David's upcoming workshop. We'll be talking about probably the Z8 a little bit, um, why I can't stand Sony's cameras right now, and uh, what are you drinking today, bud? <laughs> I've got an Ethiopia. It's a new one. It's got notes of plum, pear, so very stone fruity, but it's got this nice hazelnut finish kind of like on the back end. So it's really something different than what I'm used to with Ethiopia. Usually you get the brighter notes, the berries and stuff, but this one's really kind of more subdued, but really nice. Nice. Love that. I have, uh, I should probably say, again, I am drinking a factory coffee. Um, as a sort of disclaimer, I am kind of more or less working with them on some stuff soon. So uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, but I have three bags of coffee coming from them. I'll be doing like little reviews and some content nice. of their stuff. Yeah, they got a uh, Peru, a Guatemala, and an Ethiopian. They're all new coffees that I'll be uh, brewing up and making a little bit of content about. Um, Dan at Factory nice. Coffee is a really good dude, and uh, I really do like their coffee. I go probably at least twice a week. So, um, awesome. yeah, I stayed in for a shot and a latte today, and then I grabbed a drip coffee on my way out, and uh, here we are. Yeah, so let's back that up. Did you say time with the S2, the S5 2? 5S2, S5 2, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, because we didn't talk about that last week. We did not. So, uh, if you follow me on social media, though, you'll know there that this week I have been running this year S5 2. And uh, I have a lot of feelings and thoughts and prayers. Uh, <laughs> so, I guess I'll just <laughs> Let's jump right dig into in. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is a fantastic camera. This camera is about $2,000 uh, for the body. And it has. And you rented it, to be uh, clear. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, lensrental.com, uh, no affiliation with them. This is the first time I've ordered from them. Um, but it came in a really nice Pelican case. Everything was boxed very nicely. They give you the return label and everything like that. You basically just like dump it off. They even give you strips of tape, they give you everything. It's pretty awesome. That's awesome. And uh, so, I rented the 518 the body and the 16 to 35 f4 pro um got all of it for a week for about 280 dollars out the door which isn't bad um especially considering the uh you know how painful it would be if you were to rent all or buy all of this and then hate it uh so <laughs> 230 dollars the point i yeah. mean there's a couple of these companies out there that do this you can basically go all in on an entire system for about 10 percent of the total cost for a week and get to know it that's definitely a really nice thing to be able to do yeah for sure and it's not it's not cheap cheap right but it's uh you know this is probably pretty close to four thousand dollars worth of stuff for 230 bucks for a week yeah um and what's really nice about lens rental if you get approved and things like that uh they don't charge you a deposit on your card they don't put that hold on your card while you rent which is that's really nice which is really nice right so uh i'm gonna go ahead and add some some uh iso to my camera but yeah uh my first impressions are very good about this camera. I am super impressed with all the things I thought I would be super impressed with. I absolutely adore having shutter angle again. It is just the best thing when I'm switching between doing B-roll and doing A-roll and doing all that. Um, all of the codec options are super amazing. I cannot believe this thing can shoot open gate 6K at 30 FPS. I cannot describe to you how nice that is for basically everything I do that's content creation. Like <laughs> being able to just know I'm going to get a 4K like uh, grab of vertical stuff and horizontal stuff and I can reframe however I want. It's amazing. And it runs really well in Premiere. It doesn't like bog down. I didn't get any any weird problems editing any of that footage color grading any of that footage i love vlog i think it's probably uh at least close to one of the best consumer camera log profiles that exist 
Um, I really like the raw files for the photos. Was really happy with a lot of the the um, dynamic range. I was very happy with how it uh, pulled up shadows. Uh, I had showed you, and I put it in my story, a couple of shots I did of Jade, which I pushed two full stops on the exposure slider at 3,200 and 5,000 ISO, and they're just as clean as you would hope yeah. from a 5,000 ISO. Really clean. Yeah, like, and that was no external noise reduction or anything like that. That was just rocking the camera and doing the thing. And, and... 5,000 ISO backlit in an office playing fetch with a dog. This thing autofocused on that dog and it got keeper shots. And that's awesome. And that's one of the things that people were really going to scrutinize about this camera. So to hear that come from you is. Yeah. Is I mean, and so background, if you haven't heard me talk about it in other episodes, I, I ran Lumix for years. Like I started on a 7D and then promptly when I got into video for uh, FYEP and all the stuff I was doing, I went to a GH4 and then I went to a GH5 for many years. Uh, did both professional work and leisure work, YouTube, uh, all the stuff that I did. I loved that camera for photos. I, I ran the heck out of them. Um, but for video, I was always running a Metabone Speed Booster, and I was running a lot of Canon EF glass. Uh, just because at that point, you didn't really have video continuous autofocus at all. So it didn't really hurt you to just say, well... I guess I'm just going to go manual and Canon's DSLR lenses are some of the best manual focus lenses you can get that aren't cinema yeah. lenses. Uh, yeah. I had the 70 to 200 F2 8 L2 and uh, I ran their 24 to 105 F4 for a while and stuff like that and, and some of their primes um, and then a bunch of Sigma stuff as well. And uh, I love those systems. So to have mm. every single thing I liked about those systems in this camera and have affordable sharp really well controlled breathing and chromatic aberration prime lenses with autofocus is kind of crazy did you say well controlled breathing is that to say there's no breathing compensation in the body because you don't need it yes um, oh wow. so what a revelation so Lumix is kind of nuts. They have an 18 a 24 35 50 and 85 prime all about the same size and weight so you can swap them on gimbals that's really nice they're very well breathing controlled all of them across their line so they're video centric the autofocus is fast and snappy as much as uh, the system can autofocus uh the continuous video autofocus so far has been really impressive i haven't really yeah. had any major issues with it other than some like psychological things because it'll still keep my subject in focus but it'll come in and out of tracking the human eye a that's lot. what i was going to ask do they yeah. have a dedicated yeah. eye okay and i actually really like the implementation they have a, a yellow box and then they have a like a cross and it sh the cross mm -hmm. kind of goes between the eye that it's focusing on but it's not nearly as sticky as the sony obviously mm. but what it'll do is if, if your like main autofocus box is on your subject, it'll go in and out to that face, but it'll just kind of default to where it needs to be, where that box is um, when it's not tracking the face. And generally, you're probably pretty good. I'm not sure. Yeah, everything. that's probably good enough. It, and it is. And it I haven't experienced any pulsing of the autofocus. I haven't experienced any weird like just shoots to the back or something, which I have had even on like uh, the ESR when I had it, right? Like, and that was their first mirrorless implementation more or less, right? And I was having more issues with that autofocus than I was with this, which is their first implementation of phase detect autofocus from Lumix. And uh, so generally that whole experience has been really, really good. Uh, so I kind of adore the cheapness of the lenses all of their all of their primes are sub one thousand uh, dollars. Mm. This fifty mil f one eight, which I remind you, is pretty well controlled for chromatic aberration. I haven't had any major like glaring issues at all, and I've shot Good. like backlit into crystals and stuff like that, like trying to get uh, bad CA. So it and sounds like good value across the board. It's like four hundred forty-seven dollars. This fifty. Wow. Yeah, that, like that's incredible. And then the other ones, they're between like seven and nine hundred dollars uh, for some of the the harder ones. I think the eighteen is um, one of the more expensive ones, 
and so is the so the wide ones which i imagine are probably because they're pretty sharp and pretty fast wide lenses um they're a little bit more on the the higher end but i think the other ones are about 700 bucks which is like the 35 Mm. and the 85 and uh yeah so those all of those impressions are really good for video now photo while i love the files there's just kind of like a sluggish nature to how the system kind of responds to what you're doing. Mm. I haven't necessarily found it to be like not getting the images that I'm capturing. It just doesn't instill like loads of confidence. Whereas yeah. like, something I can do with the Sony, which I will do, uh, you know, in, in firearms, we call it like point shooting, right? But like, I will literally just like, put my camera up i know the focal length i'm at so i kind of have a very good idea of where the framing will be and just snap a couple off and i just know and feel that it goes Mm -hmm. and i probably got the shot if i just needed something real quick like to 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 to, you know a little incognito shooting around at like classes or something sure there's there's not a super positive fast like it'll take that second to get the af box green and then it's just like, it just doesn't feel like it's like, got it. Like it just doesn't rock the shutter right when that thing turns green and it thinks it has it in focus. It just, there's a sluggishness there. There's like a hesitation. It just, yeah. Like it just doesn't feel like it's like I press the button and it goes. It's like uh-huh. I press the button and it goes, okay. And like, I don't love that because uh-huh. it's again, yeah. I, I don't think I've missed any shots yet. But it's a psychological thing. It's like a confidence thing. And I don't want to work through that when I don't have to with the Sony, right? So right. between that and some of their some of their like settings, they have their constant uh, live view. And like, I guess it's something like a, a shutter. Um, I don't want to say like simulation. I don't really know because I was just trying to shut them all off. I didn't want them. But it, uh, essentially it lets you kind of preview what that image will look like as you're taking it and it slows the system down quite a lot it makes it a little laggy and i i didn't love that experience at all so i had to turn basically all of those settings off after i did that it was a little snappier but i think like that kind of ruined my flow and from the week like it was a few days where i was like really loving it and then this kind of thing happened and like it was enough for me to go i don't think the system is ready for me to buy into it yet so it sounds like they're maybe using um, like a less powerful processor behind everything, unlike what Nikon, Canon, and Sony are doing. Um, because I remember back in the DSLR days with Nikons where you would have to flip the switch to get into live view mode, and it certainly slowed everything down. Yeah. Um, so it sounds so similar to that kind of experience, but on mirrorless, which is a little weird. Right, well, because there's no optical viewfinder right so it's all live view regardless yeah it's right. just like different settings for different types of shooting um right and that's kind of i mean that's where the problem with having almost infinite options comes like there's settings that i'm not sure exactly what they're called anymore or what i like digging through those parts of the menu were kind of lost on me because sure. i haven't used the system in a while and uh it was just kind of tuning that was a lot harder um which is just that's something that you need time. Um, I'm finding yeah. I'm finding myself pressing the delete button instead of the play button a bunch on the Lumix because mm. it's it's where the play button is on the Sony, um, and then you know I'll shoot all day with the Lumix and go back to the Sony and I I realize you know two almost like, well I guess three full years of really shooting really hard with the Sony cameras I've just gotten so used to all the stuff um, that happens yeah. yeah yeah right so. Beyond that, I think I probably messed up a little bit in my like planning to try to test this system because I got the 16 to 35 f4 because I knew I would want to do like vloggy stuff and like kind of this. I was actually going to just shoot the episode on the 16 to 35, but I decided against it last second just because I'd rather show it on camera or whatever. But um, I didn't really I didn't really use the 16 to 35 that much this week. Um, and I realized I would have benefited much greater if I had just rendered the 70 to 200 F2.8. 
Um, but you know, to rent that lens alone was one forty seven or something like that. It was much, much more money. Um, mm-hmm. I think I pretty much got the fifty mil and the sixteen to thirty five for the cost of the mm-hmm. seventy two hundred. Um, but if I had gotten the seventy to two hundred, I could have really spent some more time working out the types of photography that I want to be shooting sure. with a photography camera. Cause like generally it's, I take snapshots and like my daily like content and stuff with a 35 and then everything that's serious, I grab my 70 to 200. So I kind of blew it honestly. Cause, uh, the 16 to 35, it's a great lens. The autofocus on it works flawlessly. Um, their Lumix pro line of lenses all has a manual focus clutch, which I love. Um, it feels good. It's a freaking 16 to 35 with a 77 millimeter filter thread, which is kind of gnarly. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's a thick lens. Yeah. Um, and I can grab it real quick. Uh, like it's, it's quite, quite the hefty boy, a little chunky, um, yeah. but I love the clutch. I think it feels really good. Um, the glass is remarkable. Like it, they, they're nailing it all their, you know, it's, partnered with Leica. Leica wouldn't put their name on something if it wasn't good, right? So like build and things like that are they're up to snuff. Like you're not sure. you're not missing anything. Um they're a little bit pl- more plasticky than I'm used to. Um but that also makes them really light. And that's pretty sweet. Mm. I wonder so, if that also makes them a little more susceptible to breaking if they were to be well, yeah, knocked around. Probably, but uh, I'm pretty sure their 70 to 200 is built like a freaking you know tank. So, um, but we don't know that, do we? Yeah. Well, materials and stuff would be comparable. I think they go to metal and they're they're big chunky boys. But sure. Uh, yeah. Like you know, I don't think the G Masters are super metal feeling and stuff either. So sure. Um, the prime. So. That is. What kind of can you be? Uh, can you go into detail about the range of types of shoots you set up to test these things? Uh, out? Unfortunately, two of them fell through. Uh, oh no! I did. I did a bunch of basically all my content for the week at work was with this. Sure. Um, I did some stuff on the range. Uh, I've done some product stuff. Uh, shot some dogs. Shot some. You know, basically all the stuff that I would normally do, and kind of took it around downtown just walked about and stuff like that okay and uh i carried it as though i was carrying my camera like through the philippines in my little sling bag and just like Mm -hmm. had it whenever i went places and the experience is so freaking close like generally there was nothing ultra negative there's just a couple of things that aren't super confidence inducing it takes a little longer to turn on um and that's minor but it's it's enough for me to notice uh but man i like if i was just needing a camera like today with no other gear i absolutely would be buying this camera if i didn't have to sell a whole system to go to it and i only had the money that i have i would 100 percent be buying the s5 too um i would probably get like the 35 and the 85 instead of the 50 um, and then I would probably try to either save up for the 70 to 200 28 or I'd get the F4 version, which is like a thousand dollars cheaper. Um, it's, it's got almost everything there. The second they do a new S1, um, probably not the S1 H2 cause that's going to be your like S2 H, whatever they call it. It's going to be really mm-hmm. expensive. Um, that's going to be like at least a $4,500 camera and I don't really want to switch into that. It'll be very large and size is still kind of a big deal. Yeah. To me, but uh, I, I, I'm i going to strongly consider an S1. Um, they have the s 52 x coming out, which actually gives you all I, uh, like video codecs and some ProRes options and some things for only $200 more than this body. So I was considering that, but I'd, I'd have to wait just a little longer to see um, if it has any other perks, if there is some kind of like processing upgrade to it or something as well. Um, which could be if they were obviously running more codecs and stuff like that. Uh, but it just needs to feel a little less sluggish. Otherwise, I've been very happy with how the autofocus is. I would say that it's probably better than my experiences with Fuji. Sure. Um, which is, you know, I would say they're they're trailing right behind all the other flagship camera companies for autofocus. It- 
that seemed to be about expected too when this camera launched. So that's good to hear. I mean, yeah. they're they're on the right track. So I'm curious now, uh, holding true to our convictions with this firmware stuff, do you think you're going to be interested in renting more systems or holding out for an A7S4 that may or may not be announced by the end of this year or something? Yeah. So I'm still I'm still genuinely trying to figure out where I want to move to. I'm I'm yeah. I'm daily unhappy with the sony um yeah. there are some shortcomings with the a7 IV that this camera answered where i went oh if like i just had these couple of things i literally would have a much more inspired time shooting uh that was huge for me i i don't feel super inspired by the a7 IV often uh it was fun to shoot the s5 II. um i <laughs> I wish I could describe how important open gate is to me. It it's so freaking important. It's so good. It's the most useful tool I've seen from a consumer camera in years, and I just don't understand why a processor on a 12 megapixel camera doesn't have it. I really don't. Like they're they're blowing it not having open gate on the Sony. Um and what that would also open up for them is the ability to use like 2x anamorphics and stuff with the proper with a proper aspect ratio because you can't get um you can't really use those really really gnarly anamorphics well on like the fx3 or the fx30 or anything like that because they are 16 by 9 only and you need you need to go for three or or three two to to have enough um like sight picture basically to to make that work um you know, that's why they make like those 1.3 anamorphics and stuff. And they just, they don't have enough of the anamorphic look to care. So I, I haven't been super enticed. Um, if I plan to redo this rental, which I've been kind of considering for late May, okay. uh, Elemental Media owns and rents out um, the, what, the Atlas Orion uh, 40 millimeter anamorphic. Oh, and I would I would consider renting this with a PL mount adapter and trying to do like some retouching work or something for them in return for like two days with that lens if they have mm. if they have the time or if I can just like kind of sneak over and do some test shots and stuff at their their studio because um, that's huge and I am interested in shooting anamorphic I like anamorphic uh, narrative filmmaking is something that I want to be doing more of. And I think I sure. would do more of it with the Lumix than I would the Sony. Um, yeah, it's it's been wild, uh, but it it's left me with more questions than answers. Um, I'm still very much interested in the Z8, uh, seeing what's happening there. Um, I think a lot of their lenses are priced really well. Uh, they're also doing like F1.8 lenses for a lot of their primes, so you can get them much much cheaper than like Sony's G Masters, and they're going to be just as sharp and whatnot. Um, I'm still pretty sure I wouldn't get it if it doesn't have a mechanical shutter. That's what's stopping me from getting the ZV-E1 even out of like uh, spite, um, or that's what's stopping me from liking the R8, because the R8 is like $500 away from being one of the coolest cheap cameras too. If that was 2000 and not 1400 and it had a joystick and a mechanical shutter thing shoots 4k 60 it'd be such a nice way to get into the canon ecosystem um it has almost everything that i would need otherwise uh it's 24 megapixels like the s5 ii um and that would be something that i would rent but it doesn't have a mechanical shutter and i just know that with telephoto stuff and sports and things like that and and action stuff that i do for work i i would get so mad um because i know it's not fast enough like we know that the silent shutter on the Sony a7 IV isn't fast enough. Um, so it's just a bummer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. The readout speed on the a7 IV is not great at all. And I have been shooting silently for the last week or so. And one of the things you got to like adjust to as a shooter doing that, especially for wildlife, especially when you're at a long focal length like I am lately with 500, 600 mil, is um, shooting in a like high shutter speed or uh, 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 frame rate because what I often am doing is kind of quickly panning to where say a bird would perch, get there, take a burst of like five or 10 shots and somewhere in the middle is going to be an image that isn't 
warped because of that slow readout speed. Now I could shoot mechanical, but lately I've been getting within within 10 feet from some of these birds that I want to shoot and they're going to hear that shutter and I don't want that. So I'm shooting silent to get closer, which is great, but having to throw out, throw out a good number of shots that are unusable because they're warping from that slow readout speed. So I hear that. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's huge. Like, uh, the, you know, the Z nine has a stacked like fast boy sensor, so they can kind of get away with it. But, uh, what about banding? I, I guess I'd have to revisit what that looks like for lights and stuff like that, because there's still situations where there's no shot. I would go silent, uh, depending on the artificial lighting that I have. Um, cause you're just going to get tons of banding and it's not going to look good. Um, Again, this is this is kind of echoing some of the some of the woes that DSLR holdouts are like worried about with going yeah. to a mirrorless camera. They're just like, dude, I can't. Like, there's not a shot that I would ruin a whole shoot because that's what I chose to do. And that's one of those things where I I've definitely shot silent, say for a wedding in a venue where you want to be shooting more silently, and you notice the banding because there's different kinds of lights all over the place. I have never experienced a stacked sensor, and I'm curious if you know, or maybe you don't, because we just kind of made note of that, but does a stacked sensor help with banding? I, I have no idea. Well, as far as I know, my my only experience with the faster sensors were like the A9, and it, it wasn't fixed. Like, it's still, oh, still going to okay. be a problem for a camera like that. Um and it just sucks because there's so much types of like LED lighting and stuff that has different refresh rates and things like that. Yeah. So like, um, oh, going back to another reason why the freaking uh, Lumix is so nuts, man, because they have shutter angle, which yeah. for the uninitiated, the way uh, film kind of deals with their shutter is like a you can kind of look at it like a pie chart and however much of that uh, window that goes through like an old school video camera, um, that's kind of how they describe it. You can have half of the circle open. That's 180 shutter. That's the standard normal shutter. So when you go to 24 FPS, it's going to be 48, uh, one over 48. When you go to 30, it's going to be one over 60. When you go to 60, it's going to be one over 20. Um, but what they also have is synchro scan, which is I can go to 181 degrees shutter. I can go to 182 degrees shutter and yeah. you can really dial in the motion and the light frequency and stuff and mm -hmm. and complete and it's so easy you can have it in your quick menu so i can just go boop and get right where i need to be to avoid lights for video even which is incredible yeah and i'm wondering now that we're like really stepping into more advanced things like ai chips for things that help with focusing is do we are we going to have like maybe dedicated little ai chips that help automatically fix our shutters to, to match with some of the lighting conditions so that we don't have to try and do that manually. Could we just get synchro scan on all the other stuff? Right. It's really simple. Right. It's not hard to to just look at your screen and go, do, 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 do. okay, no more silliness. We're good. Well, we're talking about like little functions that could mean a big thing for certain scenarios that camera manufacturers are just never going to implement. Like I would, I, for a long time, I would have loved to be able to just input exactly how long a shutter speed could be like for long exposure stuff oh what if i want a 55 second exposure well, you can't do that without bulb mode and like holding on until it's ready i would love to just we have super smart systems in some of these cameras now i would just can i just not put in a number yep. and let it go yeah <laughs> I, I, I don't know man um you're getting into hard mode where people go like uh, this is kind of a tangent, but I guess Sony's looking at doing a ZV-1 camera at the end of the month. And I saw like, that. And there's just all these like stupid consumer cameras when you're literally not like updating the thing that I'm, you know, using my freaking livelihood. You know what I mean? Like I'm using these cameras and other people are using these cameras for their freaking livelihood. I don't think... You would sell an A7S S four right today. Like every they it's, would it's freaking sell out. Like and we're not asking for incredible things. You can give me an A7S three with these open gate and freaking these tools that you should have yeah. had in these cameras years ago. And I'd be fine. It, I know it's I'm just complaining, but it's so frustrating that there's like all these cameras that are so close and they're all like one step away from being an actual usable camera. 
And it's amazing because when the A7S III launched, it, I mean, first of all, it's the third camera in a lineup of somewhat niche consumer cameras that turned out to be extremely desirable. It was a banger of a launch because it was an incredible camera for its purposes. Sony knows this and they've been just neglecting it for a long time and releasing these not quite you know, alpha cameras, the ZV camera style cameras that now have better features. It's, uh, yeah, we're going on this again and it's, it's tiring at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's annoying. Um, I, again, it sucks because there's a bunch of stuff that's super close and yeah. I'm not going to go back to an a seven S three, uh, at this point, there's no chance. And uh, again, I'm, I can, I can do everything I, I need to with an a seven four. Mm -hmm. um i have pretty much the lenses i like and i can just keep shooting but there's there's just uh, things like quality of life improvements that are so freaking close that just do them or at least like acknowledge that you're working on these other things and not all these dumb consumer cameras that like all of these sony shooters are like oh the cve one's like the best camera you know it's not you literally know it's not the best camera ever, and it's annoying as hell that people are acting like it's sweet and revolutionary when it's just throwing an old camera in a shit body. Mm -hmm. Like, that's so, so f dumb to me. One of the things that I don't think, if you don't, if you've never used the A7S cameras, or if you've never been interested enough to find out what this means, and if you've never used a camera for video that overheats, you don't know what it's like to be so frustrated on a job when you shoot for five or 10 minutes and you get that icon and then all of a sudden you cannot record anymore. The active cooling in the A7S III is a big deal and it's not being talked about enough uh, being missing in the ZV-E1. There's videos out there showing this camera that just basically can't function after 10, 15 minutes in certain scenarios. And a lot of people are avoiding testing this thing out in very hot conditions because they know it's not going to perform. There's a bunch of people on Twitter that I've seen that are like, yeah, dude, just did 56 minutes or whatever at 4K something with the ZV-E1, no issues at all. And I'm like, I, I just need to see, I don't want to read a tweet that you said it like worked out super good. Yeah. Like, I want to see somebody in more than 74 degrees Fahrenheit, like, record with this camera and not just stationary at literally, like, once they add 4K 120 to it, oh, I can't wait to see how fast that thing dies. Because the, <laughs> the A7S III will struggle pretty fast on, like, an 80 degree day if you're shooting yeah. 120. I've been out. And that's on with the... active cooling. That's a, that's what I'm talking about, man. I used to be on paid jobs with the old SLT cameras, doing you know little things, but having to do video, it was 80, 85 degrees. Camera shuts off five, ten minutes, and I literally had to take the battery out, and we'd have to stop production yeah. for you know 20 minutes, start yeah. again. It was frustrating. I do want to be clear: the the A7S III doesn't necessarily have like active active cooling. It's definitely oh, not. I thought it had an internal I, fan for that. Uh, that FX3 does. Oh, I'm confusing. Yeah, them. My yeah, bad. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it so, has. Oh, it has better uh, heat dissipation with. Like, well, of course it heat does because right? it's, it's it's a bigger camera. That like, must be what I'm thinking. There's about. more going on than the ZV-E1. Um, yes, that's but, the point. But I'm I'm talking 15, 20 second clips at 4K 120 and 80 degrees. That's not super hot, and like running into issues pretty fast. Yeah. So, what? Like, okay, can I just get freaking? Breathing comp. I don't even care about any of the other features. Just put breathing comp on this camera. I'm allowed to be pissed because I spent 10 grand on Sony shit and I had to sell that camera because I would only use this for work. Mm -hmm. Like that's so stupid. Mm. I'm, oh, it's so yeah. dumb, man. Okay. Yeah. Just let's make this $2,000 <laughs> camera that can't even replace the Sony a7S III for any serious work and then right. take away its ability to even kind of shoot good photos. The, I, I would consider getting it just because I want the a7S III features with breathing comp, except for the fact that it doesn't have a mechanical shutter or mm. a freaking EVF. That's why the FX3 is DOA for me, dude. I'm not going to ever not have an EVF. And I'm so sick of video shooters that say it's not necessary because you're <laughs> high. 
I don't care <laughs> like what day on a freaking overcast day, those Sony flip out screens are not bright enough to look at. They're not for any serious work. And there's a lot of stuff where I'm not dragging a freaking batteries in a, in an Atomos recorder and stuff with me. I can't right. do that, dude. Like, yep. <laughs> there's multiple reasons, even for video, why you want an EVF. Yeah, there I've, is. I've been using EVFs for video since the GH4. I am not going to stop. Like, yeah. if they made a hot shoe adapter, like EVF or something, I'd be super down. I'd be into it, and I would start to consider an FX3, and that'd be a nearly perfect camera for me. But it has to have an EVF. That's why I never switched. And I, I can't remember. I know the FX30... Um, well, unfortunately, the FX30 doesn't have a mechanical shutter either, which is stupid, but it can only shoot like one one still. It can only do like a single frame, so you can't get burst oh. photos or anything on the FX30. Um, and I'm not sure what the limitations for photos are on the FX3, but it would probably kill me a little bit. Hmm. That sounds like an artificial limitation, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, That's yeah, because like, I don't understand why your, you know, your mechanical shutterless camera can't shoot burst. That's weird. Not, not even like a five FPS, like because they don't want it to. That's all. Yeah, because oh, it's not. It's because we have a. It's not for that. We have an A sixty seven hundred coming out, probably, and you know we can't have that not get purchased. How about you just make one fucking camera that's good that people want to buy? <laughs> Incapable at this point. Yeah, it I seems. I comment on every single one of their social posts, I and know. I and I, I see know. like. Uh, there's people like, man, yeah, I really can't believe I still have an A1. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah, I'm sorry for people listening to this and I'm just still complaining about this, but it's like, it's driving me through a freaking wall, man. Well, especially, I mean, we're talking about now in the context of you renting other systems. Like there's actual interest in complete other systems because yeah. of this frustration. It's fair. Yeah, it's, oh, dude, it's so lame. Anyway, so Sony's still trash and uh until they have even like some kind of open communication with like what their plans are so i just like again make it make sense 2023 is like my mantra like i just need to know that you're working on it or like i'm gonna have something to move to because the a7 IV isn't enough camera for me it just isn't and, uh, you know, there was, uh, I think Patrick Tommaso made a post that I retweeted yesterday where he was like, you know, you can have all those fancy cameras and stuff like that. But remember, like, all you probably need is your iPhone. And I agree with that, but I enjoy making stuff with cameras. So I yeah. want a camera that's good. I'm willing to pay for good gear. Yep. Um, it just feels like this, like all the arbitrary, like crippling of this, of this stuff is so dumb. Um, and I used to be very careful when I said artificial crippling because, like, you never really know what the limitation is. I'm in a company that, you know, we're R&D and making true. stuff. But then when you have several cameras that are at the level or worse that are doing the features that you should be supporting on your stuff, it just actually, like, you disrespect me. Like, you think <laughs> I'm stupid or something. I don't know, like you, you truly don't care about somebody who spent $6,000 on one of your bodies to give them a very simple firmware update that your, that your premium highest end lenses require, I should add, um, this will be, yeah, no kidding. You, yeah, like I've said before, if you could buy lenses that don't have breathing, that would be a different story. Yeah. Lumix does it for a fraction of the price. So, like, it's possible, and sure, maybe, you know, maybe they're getting a little extra help on their lens design because they are partnered with Leica. That's fine. Like, those are, they they make incredible stuff, period, regardless of how you feel about them. But it's just, yeah, it's maddening. This will be the last episode that I, like, fully complain about this. I'm going to probably still say at the beginning of our episodes that they still haven't updated them, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the ranting because this is just kind of, uh, I've gotten to oh. the point where now I have data to support that other cameras yeah, for do. less money are just as good, if not better, in a lot of cases. And just definitely keep commenting on the Sony posts. I like seeing those. Dude, I'm gonna stay petty for until they get their head out of their ass or something. It's <laughs> it's painful. It is super painful. Um, again, yeah, we're 40 minutes in. New topic. Let's do something <laughs> for sure. Uh, so. I have a couple here. Um, I did want to talk about the the couple of things we've noted about the Z8. Um, 
I think we're both operating under the assumption that our hopes and dreams are that it's around like that thirty eight ninety nine mark, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we're really, really, we're like, we can taste it. We're so close. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on the system because I am curious. And again, I'm flirting with other systems. Um, so I was looking at like the lens setups, the things like that. I didn't realize that one I did, but I had completely forgotten because I think I've talked about them on the episodes, but uh, they just like, I didn't realize that Nikon made their own Tamron uh, formula stuff like they have the 17 to 28 and the 28 to 75 for like way cheaper which is brilliant um right and i think this is the reason why they came out with that statement a couple of months ago yep. about how third-party lens manufacturers aren't going to be able to put similar designs on the nikon system so this was what was interesting to me because i i know that tamron was working kind of outside the norm for some of this focal range stuff yeah so i i actually didn't even realize that either so what were you finding well, so you can you can get into a Nikon system, still be buying Nikon lenses, get like the 17 to 28 f2.8 instead of a 16 to 35. You can get a uh. 28 to 75 f2.8 instead of the 2000 something dollar 24 to 70. Um, so they have they have a range of options. Their their primes are very sharp still, and they work really nicely sure. from what I've seen, and are like Lumix, few hundred dollars cheaper than relative equivalent of the Sony stuff. And then they do have like ultra premium stuff. They do have a 51 two and a, and a, uh, well, the, those other lenses are the S line. So like their one eights are the S line. Oh really? Yeah. They're not like, Oh, but then I was sitting there thinking about it. I was like, so what would I do if I switched over? And it's like, okay, well I could go get an F to Z adapter and still get any of their hundreds of lenses. Mm hmm. Um, if I needed something very particular and it should work really nicely. I mean, I still liked running EF mount stuff with the adapter on the, the RF system. Um, they work yeah. really nice. They talk just like they should. It's not like using a Sigma adapter on, uh, you know, with a, a first party lens and kind of, you kind of lose some, some goods. Like it's a f basically a fully fledged system if you consider that. And, so uh, I think clearly here then we're going to we're we're excited I'm excited because you know I, I used to shoot Nikon and I'm interested in seeing all these camera manufacturers pushing the bounds a little bit so that they're all staying in competition you know if you have one that's way up there there's a little less uh, incentive to be creative and innovative. So the curiosity here is, is the Z8 going to have some of these features lacking in like the A7 S3 open gate and breathing comp? It, it, do, do Nikon lenses even have terrible breathing to begin right. with? Do we know that? I don't know that. So, you know, that's yeah. that's something that I have to look into. Um, I guess because the Z9 was just such an expensive camera, there wasn't tons of people doing tons of content on the video features. I know Jordan Drake really likes that camera, um, and he's the video guy for DP Review TV, right? So, um, you know, he's one of the few people that when he says he likes something, I listen because I generally am pretty well aligned with his his suggestions and stuff. Um, if if this is sub four thousand dollars and just that next step of we are focusing on being like a hybrid a seven r five killer, you know, not necessarily as large of megapixels, staying around that forty five mark, so you can get eight k if that's where you really want to go. I disagree with that choice, but yeah. um, you know, you you can you could probably get there. Um, if they do decide to do a stack sensor, does that mean that they're going to have some of the best eight k available? Um, they one of the things I have here today is that uh, the the lawsuit has been dropped for now for Red versus Nikon, and if you're if you're not privy to what that means and what that is, is that Red has a patent on internal compressed raw, uh, and they're fighting Nikon for allowing compressed raw in the body of their Z9, and Nikon just kind of with that BDE came in and was like, I don't think that patent is like the patentability of that is kind of asinine. And we disagree that that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> so where we're at is that I don't know all the technical terms. My patent law experience is relatively small, but I've been looking into it for certain things with my current job. So I'm not new to it. Uh, they basically mutually agreed to drop it that means that it can come back into court later 
But for now, that means the Z9 can just continue to do internal raw. What that means for the Z8, if they even offer, you know, ProRes and some raw stuff, uh, we're looking at a potential super huge boost in the system. I think they'll probably stay close to like their DSLR background. It'll be closer to like Canon where it's not fully Lumix style like video centrism, but it'll probably be better than Canon. And their AF isn't far behind in general. Like uh, people give it crap or whatever, but like their 3D tracking and stuff is super good. Um, if they just dial that in and have some focus on it, that's going to be a flagship camera by yeah. all intents and purposes, right? Yeah. Um, and at the time of recording this, we have a list of rumored specs about the Z8. But one of the things I particularly don't remember seeing was exactly what processor is going to be in this camera. And that's important because the Z9 is built to be like a sports action camera very fast. And what is what I'm curious about is what are they going to do with the, the, the Z8 is probably Nikon's most anticipated camera probably since the Z9 came out, maybe even more because of the D850's legacy. And what are they going to do uh, for a camera that's probably going to be about two grand cheaper to l make it worse than the Z9, but it being almost two years newer, right? Like what, what is this camera really going to be capable of? And, you know, what kind of processor is going to be in this is probably going to be an important part of what this camera can do. How fast is it going to be? At 40-something megapixels, you really have to be throwing something powerful in there to make sure that you can keep up with, you know, raw recording for video and fast. You know, even for wildlife, when I had the D850, that thing wasn't slow. Right. By mirrorless standards, yes. But back then, the thing was – there's a reason why people called the D850 like the best DSLR of all time. Yep. So it's got a legacy behind this eight, you know, moniker. We'll see yep. what comes to be. But there are some rumored specs that's exciting about this thing. And I think they're all pretty reasonable. Yeah. Well, there's always going to be somebody who's going to want the smaller megapixel, very, very fast camera. And they'll probably still default to that. I don't, I don't see a world where they're probably considering that the D8 or the, sorry, the Z8 will cannibalize the Z9 because it will just be slower. It'll probably be quite fast. I would be surprised right. if it had less than 10 FPS, like full-size RAWs, but it is, it is like you said, like what, two years newer? It's going to be their most anticipated camera. If they nail it, it's going to be the thing that makes people actually use Nikon. This was... W uh, on this spec list, the rumored spec list, the thing that I actually am skeptical about is that it has the same sensor as the Z9 because the D8 something something line has always been the high megapixel variant. You know, you expect it to be a little slower than the D4, D5, D6 line, whatever. So um, I actually wouldn't be surprised if that is wrong and it comes out to be a 60-something megapixel camera and it is slower. And then it would have the right to be slower. I would totally ex expect that, sus suspect that that's the case. But if it does have the same sensor, then it's going to be fast enough yeah. and it's going to be pretty close to the performance of the Z9. That's why I'm curious. Like, yeah. what are they going to do to this thing? Well, I know Sony has has designed a couple of different sensors that they're not using so there's there's certainly options around there for whatever nikon puts in it um i would i would be very surprised if it was upwards of 60 because that's going to be z7 territory uh i would really like to see it in that like 45 like it should it should ideally compete with an a1 is what it should do and if it can do that well where it's like around that 8k mark but just like just into that 8k mark so the megapixels aren't so big that it's like slow as heck like the the a7r5 uh they're again they're on the precipice of being one of the best manufacturers of mirrorless cameras um yeah because like sure they don't get a lot of love but their glass as far as my research this week has been <clears throat> is good and their technology is pretty good like yeah. it's all pretty much there they just need the right body to sell the right people yeah. When the Z9 launched, people were finally like, oh, okay, Nikon actually has 
capability in the mirrorless space. Like the Z6 and the Z7, good cameras. You know, AF was always questionable. And they have other small mirrorless cameras that people seem to enjoy. Like well, then they, they made the, the 6 and 7 two already, right? I know they have the 6 Yeah, two. I, I believe that's two. correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I haven't looked into the space because they aren't true D850 successors, and I left Nikon on the D850 knowing that they just weren't going to have anything even close to that jumping into mirrorless a little bit later than the others. So that said, the Z9 was a great, amazing camera that I think is worthy of a... You know, the D6 was kind of laughable because it was like one of the last DSLRs that they had made, um, and the D5 was kind of like, if you had a D5... You didn't really buy the D6 knowing that when the D6 came out, mirrorless was already going strong, right? Like what was the point almost? So the Z9 came out. Everything looks good. They're, you know, got potential. The Z8 has so much potential for Nikon to really not just not really leapfrog, but really catapult forward and be a real, real competitor again, especially if they can really step up the AF game. Yeah. Um, I... One thing that I think will like hook line sinker the Z8 is if they can come out, have it positioned perfectly to still match whatever the R5 II will end up being. That would be ideal. So if they didn't have to like wait to catch back up for another generation, like if they just nail it the first time where they're like, this is going to be a camera that you're going to be buying for the next three years. Like, people are going to wait to upgrade even a year in, and they're going to be, like, selling this camera still. If they can match that, like... They have the potential to embarrass Canon. Yeah. Yeah, like, there will be a lot of people using it. Um, I was watching... uh, Man, I already forgot his name. What was that dude's name that you suggested? But the the wildlife guy... Morton uh, Hilmer. Morton Hilmer, yeah. I was watching a bunch of his stuff, and it's, like, his his images are incredible and like Mm -hmm. what he's doing with Nikon's cameras is incredible. Uh, Mm -hmm. so it's, it's definitely there. Um, they just need to get that marketing and then really nail this body. And there's going to be tons of these Sony users even that I think might even consider switching. Um, right. And those are going to be the people that are looking for open gate. And if there's breathing issues, if Nikon says, okay, you can have breathing comp because they're they're if they can listen to yeah. that community and go, oh, we'll give it to you, right. that would be huge. Yeah. Like Sony owns the influencer marketing space. Yeah. Like 1,000% they own the influencer marketing space. Definitely. Panasonic did a really great marketing campaign, but they did not hook enough of those Sony users because they gave a ton of Sony users these cameras. And a lot of people really liked them. I know Tyler Stallman still really likes the Lumix stuff and is pretty hopeful about it. Um even though he's primarily a Canon guy, he's kind of agnostic. But um, yeah, it's it's wild. I'm I'm really excited. I'm I'm really hoping that this camera kind of just rules, man. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to see I'd like to see the influencer marketing space switch up because just everybody uses Sony cameras right now. Uh, yeah, it would be awesome just to see a bunch of like you said in social media people, influencers, whatever you want to call them, using Nikon again, right? Yeah. Like Nikon for a while now has been reserved to like the hardcore landscape people, which is yeah. cool. Like I'm in that space. I think that's cool, but there's <laughs> right. plenty of people that are not. It's yeah. fair because there's other cool cameras, but what I would love to just see people like buzzing about Nikon again. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think I had a couple of other things. I had this article here from Petapixel, uh, why buying a $14,000 lens made sense for me. Um, and it's, I saw that headline and I didn't get time to read that. Yeah, so I'm not going to dig into it real deep, but what I wanted to uh, like highlight with it is a lot of the conversation that this guy's going through when comparing this you know, incredible 400 f2.8 lens with, mm. a, with a teleconverter with his 400 and 500 primes and his 800 prime it's a lot of the same kind of mechanisms that i utilize when i'm comparing like the system change or when i'm looking at the gear and i'm trying to evaluate my needs versus what's available and it's it's a really like nicely mapped out kind of insight into that thought process and it's written so i wanted to include it it'll be in the show notes obviously but it's it's neat um and like i'm never gonna have a 400 f28 so Right. It's kind of neat. Uh, <laughs> but I, I did get a chance to open up the – because I saw it on Facebook. I opened up the comments. There wasn't many, but there was one good comment that said, that said, 
if it opens up the doors for getting me jobs to make me fifteen thousand dollars, then yeah, it's worth the fourteen grand or whatever. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, probably half of a good argument. Yes, if it's going to make you the money back, if there's ROI, ROI, of course, then yeah, it's worth it. But I think there's plenty of people that are just, you know, retirement age or they've just got plenty of money to burn and they just want it, of course, it's going to be an incredible performing lens for how, whatever it's designed to do. Um, and I know that like something like wildlife and sports are going to be, you, you can get amazing images you can't get on something like a even a 400 F4, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's got its purposes. It's a lot of money to spend. So yeah. yeah. Well, and I just, I want to reiterate also that like money is so wildly relative and yeah, like, yeah. You know, I have a nearly three thousand dollar telephoto zoom, and I don't use it that much. But right. when I do, it's because it performs in the way that I can trust. I I do. Usually, I use it when I'm being paid. Like it right. just is such a a good tool to do something. You cannot copy what a 400 mil f 28 does unless you have a 400 f 28. Exactly. So like if if your work necessitates that kind of performance and you know style it fourteen thousand dollars is not that much in the grand scheme of things you're talking about like cinema cameras that the right. body alone is like triple that so mm -hmm. when you get to to a, a truly professional wildlife or sports level uh you know even wedding photographers really could probably afford that they would never use a 400 for a wedding, probably. No, right. But, like, uh, again... Like, but you're talking about, yes, like, you can make north of $100,000 a year doing right. wedding photography alone, and that's not a big portion of that annual income, right? Right, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, you're getting incredible stuff with a third-party 150 to 600 that's, like, such a small fraction of 14K, yeah. right? And it's yeah. it's squeezing out most of the performance you would ever need from that that focal range but and guess what i'm never really doing jobs with the 150 to 600 if i'm getting paid it's licensing an image here or there so it's never really going to give me the roi but i have more fun with it than probably any other lens i have yeah yeah so it's it's just just interesting i don't know um Read through the article get some insight into how my brain works because it's very similar when when comparing like I don't want to even say apples to apples, but like you're you're looking at really, really minor differences and a bunch of stuff that it's all good. All these camera bodies are good. But why? Yeah. Am I, why am I so frustrated or why do I want like that one little feature or this or that? It's just a cool insight on that. So mm -hmm. uh, check that out. And then uh, the last thing, um, I feel like you probably had a little bit more of like a. Uh, maybe a, a hot take on it, but the, uh, you know, you saw the shotkit.com uh, moment and what is it? Uh, I can't remember. Module eight. Those, oh, yeah. those uh, very look lens adapters for vintage visuals. Uh, what were your uh, thoughts on those? So they have this, I, I watched the YouTube video um, and for people who don't know, this is like brand new. So you might, you really might not know what, I'm, what we're talking about here. It's a little lens adapter. I th that basically it's kind of thick it it has like this shifting it, it's hard to explain there's like there's patents about it basically you can attach any lens to it and it, it looks like it just makes the image softer brings the <laughs> contrast down is that really what it's doing okay so there's there's three there's three versions of these lens adapters they're yeah they, i was they, confused to be honest yeah, with you they have ef mount they have uh i think e mount they have uh pl mount um so you can you can attach a lot of modern lenses and they have the ability to simulate some vintage style some bolter some k35s which if you're a cinema file uh you'll know what a k35 is they're some of the most widely regarded old cinema lenses ever from canon um and then some anamorphic stylings i don't want to say anamorphic look because it's definitely not an anamorphic adapter um it's right. not it's not giving you like the bouquet or anything of an anamorphic lens but it's giving you some of these like soft qualities some of this stuff and the 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 you can basically dial in the strength of the effect, which is for me the most interesting thing. Cause like I like a Cine Bloom here and there. And right. I, and I like That's some, what I was gonna say. But, like you could run a Pro Mist filter so and, the, so and there's edit. Some, there's yeah, some sorry. There's some optical things that it is playing with. 
um, because it's allowing you to kind of change. Uh, you're essentially affecting the depth of field optically, not just like softening the image. Okay, um, that's an objective difference you can't really do in post. Right. Okay. So it's doing a couple of interesting things. However, <laughs> a big however, I don't see consumer level, YouTube level, uh, indie filmmaker level people spending two thousand dollars I did not know the price Woo! early bird is 999 two thousand dollars to basically kind of do optical things that you could just use like a helios or dude that's um, wild I didn't look into the Kickstarter I assumed like a hundred bucks <laughs> no these are super oh. super premium and again the the technology is interesting because they are yeah doing, they are doing sure. optical things that you can't really fake uh in post well um you know you you can't affect depth of field unless you're actually affecting the physics of the glass and the light coming through it so yeah it's it's interesting. It's a really hard sell for me. Uh, that's what I thought, and knowing knowing the price, it'll never be something I ever touch. So I was. That's why I sent that to you. I was like, "Is this something people really want? Is, are they are they providing a solution to a problem that's really out there?" I don't think so. Right. Um, I think this is a pretty gimmicky thing, and I'd love to be proven wrong. But like, you can rent some of these old style lenses, um, which most right. people are going to do. Like they were putting like really nice pl mount glass on some of these adapt and i'm like what well, you're not doing that like somebody is not gonna put like a cook lens like an right S4 that's my question of- <laughs> was like wouldn't you just get the glass yeah like, like for two, two grand what are you doing yeah it's it's pretty crazy um i understand that some of these lens kits are like 50 grand a pop and stuff but it's okay it, it sure it still doesn't it doesn't make sense um I don't know that I would put good glass in front of these. You're talking like I okay, putting like a 8512 from Canon, like an EF8512 in front of these, probably get a cool look. Yeah. But it's I I think this would be like a renting tool. I would I, I can't right. see somebody wanting to buy one of these for 2 grand. The, there has to be some production that goes, "All right, we have a scene where this tool could come in handy. We'll rent it for that day, get that job done." I can't see someone any like normal photographer you know indie cinematographer whatever just like buying this because they think it'll be the thing that really pushes their career forward or something it's it's not gonna it's not gonna look like a k35 it's just not gonna do that (laughs) you're not gonna be able to like turn a ef mount photo lens into a vintage lens like right like at that point get a uv filter throw some vaseline on there and get wild because You'll save the thousands of dollars. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to be a curmudgeon because people are pushing like some kind of idea and kind of getting wild with it. But it's it's weird and it's very yeah. expensive. I also don't want to throw shade on Moment because I like what they push with accessibility for having really cool tools to play with, especially on mobile, like you know, phones yeah. and stuff. The adapters they have, the hardware they've been able to bring to the market that was not available before yeah, and they you, seem to be well ma- manufacturing these things well and yeah have you seen yeah. their new uh their new anamorphic adapter uh i, I think i have yeah. yeah so they have like a full like front screw on like anamorphic and that yeah. thing looks sick um but to be fair this is a company called module 8 working with moment so right. so i don't know who module so, 8 is it's it's interesting That's what I was wondering, too, was I remember sending you something, I think it was in a newsletter or something I got from Moment, where they said in a couple of weeks we'll be announcing something. This has to be that thing. Probably, yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, what was Moment's involvement in this project then? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like probably the optical stuff or something. Maybe it was, yeah, I'd have to look into it. But I mean, they have a history of adapting, so maybe they have, you know, insight into that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It was it was strange, but it was worth looking at because again, it's it's different. Um, it so is. It's called the tuner. Very look. Um, yeah, very very interesting. Um, yeah. As far as anything else, though, that was kind of all I had uh, this week. I'd love to uh, finish up this show with uh, how your wildlife stuff went this morning. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, as of recording this, I actually just got back into the house about 
half an hour, maybe an hour before we started recording. I went out again this morning and for the third day in a row, I was able to have a lot of fun with uh, the a winter wren. That's a small bird about the size of a warbler and uh, it's got a very big voice and it was, it's really cool because I've been able to get very close to it. So filling the frame a little bit more, um, which is pretty ideal for uh, most wildlife photographers because there's like basically a couple of schools of thought when you approach wildlife photography. One of the most popular like approaches immediately is I want to get closer to the thing, right? Fill the frame, see the detail. Um, and that's cool. That's something that you don't really get a lot of opportunity to do, but when it's, uh, like breeding season and migrating is happening and they're very, very active and curious, uh, they're not super shy. As, at least this bird in this scenario, I was right in its habitat, getting down in there. And there's a couple of them. I've heard more than one. So one of the tools that I've been using is the Merlin app. And this app is super versatile. If you're in interested in wildlife photography, get the Merlin app. I believe it's available on iOS and Android. Uh, I've been using it to identify birds that I cannot see because it has this feature where it'll record sound and cross-check the sounds it hears versus a database of sounds that birds make and identifies which birds it's hearing. And the winter wren has a very, very easily identifiable call and song, and that's an easy one to remember. So what it also allows you to do is play back those sounds and the calls that those birds make. And that's important if you're... A hunter, you may know this, that if you play the calls of certain animals, they may come to you. Um, and so in breeding seasons, they really want to see the same species. <laughs> they want to go, if you, there's a winter wren, they want to go and find that other winter wren. So, um, you know, I'd sit in one spot where I know its habitat is. I know it's not like leaving a habitat to come see me. So I'll sit in there and then play the call and it would come to me. And that's how I've been able to get a little bit closer to these these kinds of birds in this winter wren. And I've been just really having a great time. I just got done editing a bunch of photos and I literally just imported what I shot this morning and I got a lot of good stuff. And as an update to, I think the previous episode, I was complaining a little bit about uh, focusing through branches and leaves and stuff. And uh, I quickly realized that I should have been using the small focus point for tracking. Uh, and I wasn't, I was like switching between center AF wide a little bit, um, different kinds of, uh, area AF where it had more area to choose from for the focus and locking that down to a small focus point because most of the time I'm trying to get the bird's center frame first, giving the camera very little room to decide where to focus was making it a lot easier for these last couple of days, uh, to get focus. So if you're in that same scenario, just pull the focus point down yeah. to a small point. Yeah. The, the small flex points are crucial. I use them for most things, actually, especially because, like, uh, for work, where I'm usually looking at a small detail on a relatively complex background. You know, if you're looking at a gun or if you're looking at a shooter and you're trying to get through mm -hmm. certain things, like, I, I pretty much can't use zone or anything because it'll usually go to a shoulder or go to, like, the, right. the, the front of a gun where, like, I'm not trying to focus. I'm trying to focus on an optic or something like that. Um, yeah, super crucial. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I had noticed once I started doing that too, when the camera decided, when the camera is told that it cannot look certain places to get focus, it was understanding that a bird was in front of me and that it had eyes. So IAF was activating much more frequently too. So trying to keep that focus basically on its head, that little, that tiny box for IAF was like popping up much more frequently going, oh, here we go, here we go. So I was able to kind of hold steady um, much more frequently. So we've been having a good time nice. these last right couple on. days. That's, that's really cool because uh, uh, if you guys aren't um, familiar with our I guess earlier episodes or whatever I used to run the 200 to 600 and uh, you're running the the sport version the newer uh, 150 to 600 and the only real quote unquote downside if it's a downside is that uh, Sony kind of cripples like the frames per second and some of the performance of that that Sigma just I, I guess because like just because they can competition yeah um, but to know that you're getting 
maximum performance still and that that eye auto focus is working really well especially at yeah. 500 600 and stuff that's uh that's pretty rad because i'm i'm looking at probably going to that 150 to 600 instead of going back to the sony uh if the the teleconverter doesn't work out so i'm glad to hear yeah. that now that you've worked through that it's it's going how's uh how's hit rate been because i know you were having I think at some point when you were doing birds on the the river or whatever, you you've experienced some back and forth, whether it be like really good days or really bad days. Oh or... yeah, so months ago, really, and even this is this goes back to when I even bought the lens. I was having issues with things like it seemed like it was back focusing, seemed like it was just never really quite on, and I think I've mostly solved that um, by shooting like a. Uh, a third of a stop down, keeping the shutter speed way high because <clears throat> sometimes I feel like, I don't know if this is a little bit of motion blur. I don't know. I just couldn't always identify exactly what was wrong if it was not tack sharp on the subject. And with something like the 200 to 600, you get that confidence more often. I think it was just hitting more often. Um, so with the Sigma, it wasn't perfect all the time. And, you know, it's hard to expect perfect all the time from just about anything. But I have learned over these last over the last year of shooting this thing exactly how I need to shoot it to get the results I want. And the fact that I'm there and can do that just means it was a learning curve, really. And if I have to shoot a th third stop down, that's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, I'm really at the point now where I don't feel like I'm at a loss. I don't feel like it's missing focus. And honestly, since even just this week, moving down to single point focus, um, the small point focus, sorry, it has been so on because I'm not giving it the ability to look elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That's, that's rad. And I think uh, what you've had two firmware updates for that lens. Yeah. We're going on the third very, very soon. And that's, I'm excited to yeah, see that that's third one. So wild. So cool. <laughs> Freaking okay, uh, not to get back into those the weeds of that, but that's that's very <laughs> rad that not only you know releasing a more modern super telephoto, but still supporting that freaking sport right. lens is so cool. Um, that alone yeah. makes me want to go for that over the the Sony because the uh, frankly the Sony two hundred to six hundred is a little long in the tooth now as well. Um, right, yeah. I, I don't I don't should know. probably be expecting a Mark II from that in the next year or two, right? Uh, maybe. maybe. Maybe, Maybe. <laughs> and I, I I see a ton of them for sale used all the time. So mm. if uh, if I lowball somebody and and go back with one of those, if I can get it for like you know twelve hundred bucks or something, maybe I'll do that. Um, I did like it, but um, I because I don't think right at this direct moment of recording this that I'm going to move to the the S five two. I believe I'm going to probably get the teleconverter pretty soon and cool. uh, start playing with the seventy to two hundred on that. Um, which leads me to the very last thing I want to talk about today, which is the David Sargent Detour workshop um, that's going to come up. And if you want to kind of go into that, I think I'll probably snip some of this up and throw it up <clears throat> on the Instagram too. But um, yeah, tell me about that workshop, what that's about and when that is and how people can find it if they're interested. Yeah, so it's coming up very soon. So if you're listening to this as this publishes, then you have an opportunity to get a hold of me if you have an interest in going. This is a workshop that I've been holding for, this will be the fifth straight continuous workshop I've done. Every spring, um, we go to Detour State Forest Campground. This is a really cool remote spot. It's cool for multiple reasons. And I scouted this out probably in 2017, I think, because at the time I was just looking for an area that was very far away from light pollution because I was super into astro and I still am, but I discovered that it had more potential than that. Being a state force campground there and very far away um, from, you know, any major city at all, really, you get this seclusion that uh, is really great for photographers, for people who want to be in nature and not around other people. So for, a, for workshop purposes, this is a workshop where I take um, a group of people anywhere between like four, five, six people is really ideal. I don't like to go too big with these groups. And we'll go and do bird photography, but you don't have to have a long lens. You don't have to focus on birds because there's three days where we'll focus on a lot of things. So bird photography, because spring migration is happening, we have tons of warblers. I think last year we documented 
12 or 13 different warblers alone. Uh, you know, and we have other things, bald eagles, uh, herons. We have deer that are around there. We have lots of, <laughs> we had ravens bothering us last year. Um, lots of different wildlife. We have landscape opportunities out the wazoo. You go on these trails. There's a couple miles of trails that loop around um, and you go through like hard woods and you go through these like old forests where these trees are just like massive and they're winding. And we shot in the rain a little bit last year, which made some really nice woodland photography scenarios. And it goes on to the beaches and you have these opportunities for astro on the beaches. So the Milky Way is just like arching over uh, Lake Huron and like over the forest uh, tree lines and stuff. There's just so much to work with. Sunrises and sunsets too, just incredible. And where we stay is um, it's a tent camping scenario. So you bring your tent and it's just a couple of us. So we'll get a fire going and, um, you know, you wake up, get out of your tent and walk 30 steps and you're on the beach. It's super cool. So yeah, it's been fun. Um, I asked $250 and I lead this workshop. So I'm very familiar with the area. Um, and I can, you know, tell you exactly what to expect when we get into certain areas going on the trails and I can tell you how things used to look and maybe what to expect in certain conditions. So that's the benefit of like going along with somebody on one of these workshops where maybe you're not familiar with the area and you'd be really comfortable with someone who is and who can also help you with uh, your camera if you're very new with photography or want to learn something like Astro or maybe you've done a lot of different types of photography and you want to just break into something new and have fun. It's a really fun trip. I'd love to see some new faces. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of still to be decided for me, but I think uh, I might run up there with him if we do that. We'll probably record the podcast up there. Uh, you know, I'm happy to, you know, throw my hand to assist anybody if you want to come out and learn maybe a little bit more about cinematography in these situations. Uh, I'll be there to kind of do a thing. Um, but it's, it's exciting. I went to uh, your other workshop. I think that was how we actually met in person, even though we had known each other for years. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know what else to say. It's going to be really cool. The UP is beautiful. Um, it is. And uh, I'm kind of excited to get out there. I, I've been needing to camp pretty good. So, uh, yeah. And forward. as far as the UP goes, like you could travel four or six miles once you, or miles, hours once you've crossed the Mackinac Bridge. But in this case, it's only about 45 minutes drive east once you've crossed the bridge to the great north. So it's not too far out of most people's way when you're considering going to the UP. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty awesome. I, the location seems cool and I haven't actually been in that area before myself. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I hope I can make it work. Um, yeah, that's May 19th to May 22nd, by the way. That's yep. uh, three days. Um, it's just a lot of fun. So yep. it's coming up very, very soon. So if, if you are interested, even if you don't know if you can make it or not, if you just have a couple of questions or if you know somebody who is, give me a, a message uh, at underscore David Sargent on Instagram. You could find me on Facebook and David Sargent Photography at gmail.com if you want to get a hold of me. Yeah, I'll have the information to this workshop in the show notes and his website and yeah. stuff. That'll have some information on like kind of what to pack if you're kind of thinking what this looks like. It'll give you a kind of a, a nice window, but obviously reach out to him if you're interested. Uh, I think it's a, a cool way to meet some people and, you know, hone your craft, get a little bit better, mm -hmm. shake things up. So, yeah. Right on, man. I think that's all I got for you today. That is it for me. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks for listening. Uh, you know. Take a look at the show notes. Look at all the things that we got. Um, follow us on Instagram. I would love to get a review. Um, I'm going to remind, I guess, at this moment that we're going to do a, uh, a photo sharing in just two more weekends. Um, That's right. I'm going to post a little bit about it in Instagram. So I'm hoping to get some submissions for that. I'd love to see your guys' work. Uh, it doesn't matter what level of photography you're at. It doesn't matter if you're shooting with an iPhone. I would love to see, uh, you know, your interpretation of the prompt, which is black and white. So, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to shoot a black and white image. Um, but thematically, what does that mean to you? I'd love to see your work and we could talk about it a little bit. I like the loose interpretation. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. <laughs>